Scottish version in November. Well, I have to say, I think today is just another piece of evidence, certainly in my mind, of how proud I feel, and I think all of those who have been involved should feel, of creating those structures and creating the, the network, the capability that uh, has been in display here today, and which we have seen and heard uh, in the workshops. Uh, undoubtedly, the centres of expertise, both the, at the national level and at the sectoral level, have created the framework, I, I believe, for the progress and for the savings that have been made in, in recent times. Are they working perfectly? No, I, I think that would be a, an overstatement, but certainly uh, they are well on the way uh, to becoming not only permanent arrangements, which I, I believe they are, but arrangements that will continue to add value in the years to come and in those difficult times, maximising contracts, the number of contracts, the coverage of the contracts that are part of the central frameworks. I think most importantly, and for, in fact, I think at the stage we're at in the procurement journey, very, very important to ensure that those contracts are actually used uh, by the organisations, individual organisations out there in the Scottish public sector. And we've heard uh, once or twice today the term mandate, both in the workshops and latterly in, in John's presentation. And, and I believe whether it's mandate or whether it's justify why they shouldn't be used, very clearly we're at the point where uh, the use of those contracts or the fact that contracts are not used should become much more of an issue. And that's a way in which we can maximise and increase the savings that we're already seeing. Another area that I think is sometimes misunderstood is that, the, that perhaps the drive was to centralise everything that's spent. Even in an activity where there's maximum contract coverage, even where there is maximum contract usage, it's likely that there will still be 40 to 50 per cent of the expenditure, the procurement expenditure, that will be handled in individual organisations. And that's where the procurement capability assessments come in, where the journey from being, frankly, non-conforming for many, many organisations a few years ago is proving that it's worth. Uh, more organisations are performing better, more organisations are becoming more advanced, more organisations are ensuring that the procurement professionalism, that ethos, is applied very much at the local level. Uh, one minor concern I still have is that there are some, some, still some organisations that are non-conforming. Uh, and those organisations that are non-conforming, as assessed by the centres of expertise, are organisations that I believe need to take a step forward and bring themselves up to the standards of the rest. It's been mentioned, it's fairly obvious, that cost will continue to be a major driver but delivering value is probably, as I think has been mentioned quite a few times, is probably a much better criteria. Sustainability, I also mentioned earlier, has not gone away, whether it's concern for the environment, equality, diversity, resources, I, including the, 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 the conservation of resources, water. Also local food, I think, has taken a more prominent place recently, both in the context of conserving resources but making sure we still have the capability within Scotland to provide the resources and that we don't move to, particularly move to a very strong, totally imported model. And Alistair mentioned the idea that uh, economic regeneration, training, development, SMEs should form an important part of the criteria for placing public sector tenders. As we look forward to the implications of the spending reviews and the the tougher times very clearly, uh, some organisations, the public sector, have moved towards more of an outsourced model than perhaps in the past. And I think that exemplifies a great opportunity for procurement to extend its influence, the influence that's been growing in the last few years, to extend that influence to areas that uh, are not new to procurement, but certainly where procurement presence, procurement influence has perhaps been less notable than in the past. The theory and the process of commissioning and creating outsourcing capability, and in particular making by decisions, and very, very important, the ongoing contract management are areas where procurement needs at this early stage to be more involved, more assertive, and more influential. 
One of the areas that I've been taking a special interest in recently is the area of some of the, area, some of the infrastructure procurement and some of the infrastructure itself that uh, is a, a very, very big part of uh, public expenditure and is a very, very big part of external procurement spend. Infrastructure such as support and, and social care, uh, where expenditure in this area, particularly by local authorities but also by health boards, is particularly important to the citizen and to the community, but at the same time is so highly specialised that it's often an area where procurement influence and procurement participation certainly has not been extensive. And I know the Excel organisation, for example, in the local authority sector here has started to become much more active and, and much more involved in this particular area. And the document that Alice referred to earlier, that was published just a month or so ago, I think is very, very important in that regard. Another area that's perhaps escaped or has not had as much attention from a procurement point of view is the one of construction and roads. Well, once again, the specialism, the, the engineering, the, the techniques and the, and the ethos perhaps of that sort of industry is not one that has again lent itself easily to procurement involvement. And I'm very keen to ensure that as we move forward, th these areas, which are major parts of the, the £8 billion pounds that's spent in the public sector in Scotland, I, are specially focused on and, and specially addressed from a procurement point of view. And yet another of these is information and communication technology, where undoubtedly procurement involvement in the ICT community is often a challenge and often one where specialisms and again techniques are different from routine procurement. And in that particular area, as some may know, I've been asked by John Swinney to conduct a review of the use of ICT uh, in the public expenditures in Scotland and, and look at uh, and look at where we can not only understand where we're going but, but where we are and how we get there. So he's asked me to create a vision for ICT use in, in, in the public sector, to look at the current landscape in terms of the degree of use of technologies, the utilisation and automating, as you might say, digitalising the, uh, the, the local authority, health, uh, tertiary education and, and wider Scottish government sectors where they are, how, how well that ICT has been deployed, uh, how much of it has been shared, how it's been installed, how it's operated and how it's been procured and how the external spend is conducted, how well it's managed, uh, how well it's coordinated, how well it's is aggregated and of course also looking at the level of internal effectiveness and the level of resources being employed in ICT uh, in, in, the public, in the public sector. And I'm about uh, two thirds of the way through that in terms of conducting interviews and identifying results and collecting, collecting evidence. But just a few observations on, on my thoughts so far on uh, ICT and, and eventually getting to the point of where procurement can become uh, more active in, in that particular area. <clears throat> and in terms of a vision for ICT, I think you have to start with the, with the citizen because the public sector is providing public services and very often in an area like ICT the demand can be driven <coughs> excuse me, the demand can be driven by the industry, it can be driven by technology and very often even within individual organisations uh, users can be presented with a solution without having participated perhaps enough in the demand and in the specifications. So I'm looking at a vision which is very much citizen led it would be leading over two, three, four, five or ten years to the citizens' interaction with uh, the public sector being one that is very much a digital interaction, whether it's uh, council tax, whether it's benefits, whether it's uh, repairs or complaints, whether it's uh, organising a doctor's appointment, whether it's liaising with the health service, uh, and incidentally whether it's being dealt with over, over two or three different services I, I see a great opportunity, I, as others do too within these sectors, to ensure that most of that contact is online. And a good example of that is that many local authorities are moving on a journey from face-to-face -face contact with uh, citizens to contact centre contact through into creating online transactions and online interaction. The opportunity to make huge savings but also greatly improve the quality of service and greatly improve 
the, the value and the satisfaction levels of those using the services. And of course, sharing resources and sharing services in the provision of those capabilities, I think, is very important. I, and undoubtedly, it's an area where I, we could do more at the present time. The use of new technologies will be part of that, uh, uh, that vision. I, those of you associated or with some knowledge of ICT will know that uh, in recent years, voice over IP, uh, the use of telepresence uh, or teleconferencing, uh, the, the move towards cloud computing. A very interesting trend that because I spent most of my career convincing people uh, they should have as much capability as possible on their desktops and their, and their devices, their mobile devices. And here we are in industry now, thanks to much faster communication speeds, much more capable broadband, an industry in fact encouraging uh, the move back towards centralized hosting of applications and of uh, IT capability. Back to the future is a term that I think of in that sense. But nevertheless, it has to be an important element of a vision for ICT in the public sector uh, moving forward. And I think also my vision would include a lot more partnership, a lot more detailed interaction uh, with the industry because the industry uh, is polarized. There are only a handful of very large companies at one end and then thousands of smaller uh, companies, SMEs, uh, micro organizations at the other end bringing technology and innovation and we need to find a model that copes with, with all, of those, all of those aspects. I'd say that the landscape and looking at currently is that uh, although great progress has been made, I think it's fair to say that overall uh, adoption of ICT likes what I would have expected, particularly in the context of the spend and, and ICT or external spend. Uh, it's probably getting close to about a billion pounds and internally within uh, the public sector in, in, in these areas we have, we have many thousands of ICT professionals clearly working hard, doing excellent work, but nevertheless being a significant part of the cost of ICT to the public sector. Yet on the other hand, ICT is an investment. It should be saving, it should be saving and is saving in the areas that uh, it supports. However, the one aspect of the landscape that I've found and not totally surprised with is a prevalent model, a standalone, self-sufficient IT functions in each individual organization, most of whom have their own data centers rather than shared data centers. I think the term that uh, Nicola Sturgeon used was, was, you know, let's not be too worried about being disrespectful of boundaries. Well, I, I suppose what I've found is that in some respects, if anything, we've been really, really respectful of boundaries and very intent on creating a self-sufficient standalone organizations. The implementation of ICT tends to reflect that model. That is, there is some sharing. There are some areas where sharing is, is extensive, but most, in most cases, there is commonality of purpose, commonality of applications, but very, very little of it is, is shared. So as you might guess, my report, my review, the direction of it is to, to move towards a shift in that particular area of, of activity, a more ICT, more penetration of the ICT, collecting more dot, connecting more dots to make ICT more effective and more pervasive, a looking at how we can deploy ICT in, in a way that shares more and does less perhaps at the individual organizational level, uh, recognizing that ICT can be a block to shared services uh, because of different processes and different systems and yet could unlock the door to moving forward in shared services. So a very important and pivotal role is played in, in this area by those involved in, in communication technology and information technology. I see